second day. Uh, are you having a good time? Yes. There we go. There we go. Yep. Yep. Back. Can games replace textbooks and exams? Two things that we love in schools, textbooks and exams. And the question is, can games replace them? Well, well Kathy and I, that's Kathy on the right, I have, have thought the way to run this panel is we have four people that are doing really amazing things in games. Absolutely. And what we wanted to do is give them the time to explain what it is that they're doing. Then, we're going to have a, a conversation about how what they're doing can address the theme of the panel. Can games replace textbooks and exams? On the surface of it, it sounds like an absurd question, but if you really think a little bit about it, the answer could probably be absolutely. So, but, patience, patience, patience. Let's listen to what our four panelists, and they'll introduce who they are, who they, who they are, their names, and where they come from, and what they do. And then, then we'll have a conversation, and then you folks will be able to ask questions, okay? And we will try to end at 5.40 because there's another set of sessions, okay? Okay, with that, let me introduce the first panelist, Centauri Comisto. Come on down. Thank you very much. <laughs> Get my slides going. So, um, yes, my name is Santeri Koivisto. I come from a company called uh, Teacher Gaming. Uh, in the past, I've been working with some brilliant things like Minecraft, for example. My background is in teaching. I've had, um, you know, a very fortunate position to see how games have been taken over many schools, for example, in the United States especially the education version of Minecraft. Uh, and now I'm fortunate yet again to work with about 50 game developers to bring their games into the schools. But now very onward, what Elliot said uh, that, you know, can games replace books? He said, absolutely. I say, technically, yes, but should we do it? No. And uh, so uh, let me explain you a bit what I'm doing, uh, and then I'll answer to this, my, my sort of point of view, why I said no. So, uh, like I said, I, I work with game developers, but the funny thing about those game developers is, is that they make entertainment games. So the games that kids, young people, myself, many of the panelists play already at home. So some numbers what I've heard in India is that a student during the K-12 career spends, invests, 20,000 hours into school and education, studying. During the same time, they spend about 15,000 hours playing video games. So in my head, I'm looking at, okay, how can we make this time productive one way or another? So now we looked into what are they actually playing. We found many, many, many games that are not about shooting or something not that constructive, but games where people you know, build cities, launch rockets, run governments, you know, cultivate plants, do genetics, and try to make better plants, things like that. And then we started bringing those into the, into the education and into schools. But now, let's, uh, let's look into why I said no. And I will show you one of the games that we work with and how we think that they could be embedded. And I will be running a sort of a Finnish style, very packaged lesson to you uh, at the very end of my brief presentation. But to answer the question first, why technically yes, but why I argue no, would be that first of all, if we now take the syllabus that we currently have, let's say the NCERT books, and we convert them into video games they will 100% turn into a very bad video game. The second thing is that writing one textbook chapter can maybe take maybe a day. Maybe then somebody looks into and verifies that information is correct. Did it turn into a good textbook page? Not necessarily, but it's a textbook page. But developing a game that would cover the same stuff would probably take 100 times more energy and resources. So only the most affluent schools would have the money to pay for this type of materials. 
So something else than building the games should be are needed. But now or is needed. But now the third thing is that games, from my opinion, are not really ideal when you try to memorize or grasp like large quantities of information. So for example, if I want to teach you like let's say a bit of you know European history from 19 you know 1900 to 2500 or however you say it that period would not be very easy to build into a video game and also if I as a learner would today want to learn about that period of time I would probably if I would be interested in learning about that I would probably look for a book because book is actually a great learning medium but the thing is that it's a great video when you are already interested in something so if I'm already interested in history, then what is the most compressed, compact, fast way to learn about this? Is to read text. But now, where games excel and where games are better than anything else, I'd argue, is to make people interested in actually learning what's inside that book. So the first experience, let's say I want to learn about, or you, I want to teach about space. And the first thing is that I give this 500-page book to my student, hey, read this and learn about space, they would be overwhelmed. It would be just way too sort of big threshold to start reading that if you are not someone who is you know, keen on reading in the first place. And more and more of our students are not that keen on studying that type of material. So what we can do, and I'm sure I'm showing you an ex example there, could be that we first introduce the topic to make students curious with a game, and after we have studied the theory, we also apply what we learned into a game. So now, let me uh, show you an example how one might do that. So, uh, here you can see a video game. It's live, it's not a video. I can actually show it around. I can go to Earth, and I can go very close. Just showing you a bit of how the game works going very fast, so let me slow it down. Okay, here we can see India, I'm sure somewhere. Anyways, so now we can do all kinds of tests. But let's say, as a teacher, I want to introduce my students to the concept of gravity. This is something that I've probably shown someone at the, at the booth, if you have visited. So now, everybody probably has an idea, or a thought, what might happen if the sun would disappear. So I could answer, ask my students, in the class, have you ever wondered what if the sun would disappear? What would happen? Well, some students might ask or, or like mention that maybe there's no sunlight, maybe there's no tide, it will be very cold. But we are discussing gravity. All of those are right answers. But when we actually remove the sun and we advance the time, we can see something else happening. So why is this happening? Why are all the planets escaping? We have just discovered gravity and the gravitational pull of the sun. So now, hopefully, this example made my students curious and excited about, oh, oh, I didn't know, I want to learn more about this. So now, as a teacher, I can look into a bit of theory, what, for example, two molecules, how they are pulling together each other, or maybe how, much, how about there are ten molecules and one molecule, which one do you think would pull more? And after that, I might ask my students, so what type of research questions you might have, and guide them to ask questions that could even more prove that mass has something to do with gravity. And my students would then apply what I just taught them into the game and prove it. And even, you know, learn it more deeply. Discover it to become interested in that, then, you know, have a bit of theory, and then go in, apply, and understand it. So now, this was the very quick uh, finished lesson, hope it wasn't too quick. So yeah, so as a quick summary, so I think that games do certain things like making people interested, giving us places where students can apply what they learn better than anything else that I've seen, but at the same time, in the middle, where we can actually leave, uh, learn large quantities of information, there are better medias from my point of view to do that. But at the same time, do we should we replace textbooks? I think that we should replace at least 75% of 
you know, the use of textbooks, but what should we replace them with? All kinds of different medias, including games, so our students would become multimedia sort of literate, and they would know that if I want to learn about this topic, where I can find information about that the most efficient way. The hardest thing about this is 
making um, the program for what your answer is to the fraction of mine. If you push A, then you do this, and then if you push B, then this happens, and C, then this other thing happens. So it's really hard. The fact that a nine-year-old is learning such sophisticated programming concepts is a testament to Project Headlight's success. And for Abigail, the command of the computer allows her to devote her attention to what she really enjoys. Designing a Nintendo-style interface and creating a compelling story around the gods. Ginny has designed her fraction game around the spider web. Like her classmates, she's learned advanced programming. She's also learned the advantage of producing her own game. Because you make your own game and you can play it anytime you want, but in Nintendo, this right here, you don't have to buy it because you're the one who's making it. With Nintendo as a model, she's even designed her own game box. Like, at first I didn't know how to design a web. In fact, as part of the project, all the children package their games and promote them with an ad campaign. These integral activities make this project unlike any textbook exercise. The students here are designing a real product from start to finish. And through the process, they learn about every advertising medium. They even produce TV commercials. To play this game, play it good. May grow up to be like Robin, like Robin Reagan. Wow. Green Town is awesome. It's spooky, it's scary, and it's exciting. And it's by TCA. Awesome. So I think you got a flavor on what these kind of games looked like. They weren't very fancy. And actually, this was a very old programming language logo, so the kids had to program every single piece on the screen. But it proved extremely successful when compared to other classes and teaching kids how to program and also how to learn about fractions by doing all of those things. So the constructionist, the making games for learning approach, I think is as important as the instructionist playing games for learning and here is just an array of the many, I mean, close to 100 game-making tools. Scratch is just one of them more recently. Uh, and if you come tomorrow to my breakout session, I'll talk a little bit more on what we actually have found that people can learn when they make their own games. Over 10,000 of students around the world have participated in various projects. And I think we need to kind of put this side aside with playing games for learning. But what I think what this shows us, rather than to create a divide between playing and making games, we really should think about connecting those two. We should think about games as systems that are played and made to solve problems, design systems, and understanding human behavior. And then they give us also a platform to think about what we should do about textbooks uh, and exams. And I think in the future, if you look at playing and making games, the books, the hard copies, are going to be probably away. And I don't think they're going to be replaced by uncurated online content, just by, because what textbooks are doing, they organize events. More likely, inspired by the games, we're going to see something which Alan Kay and Adele Goldberg over 30, 40 years ago called personal dynamic essays. Why do you have, need to have, I mean, a still printed page? You can actually embed the games in text. You can make them manipulable. You can make them social and connect them to around the world so that the knowledge can be updated, can be interacted with, and can be commented on across the world. And I think that is where the textbooks of the future are going to be, and games and simulations are going to be a part of that. Thank you. This is Daraj, Kenan Darajan, and I am going to take you on a very brief journey in the time allotted about an idea that I believe um, the genesis of the idea, the development of the idea, and uh, the initial product out of the idea that could potentially 
um, have an impact in the field of education and has some relevance, I promise, to the topic at hand. Um, so again, my name is Dharajan and Dharajan. I'm a doctor, I'm a neurologist by training. I um, am subspecialty trained in neurophysiology. This all has some relevance to the, uh, to the topic at hand, I promise. Um, so what I do on the medical side is I take, um, we, we monitor patients as they go into brain and spine surgery. We run small electrical signals through the nervous system. We interpret those signals and we give feedback to the surgeon who acts on those um, signals in real time, acts on that information to have improved outcomes for the surgery. Um, I am also a father of two kids. They are currently going through the schooling system in California. Um, that's where I live. Um, and in seeing them go through this educational process, this idea, this aha moment came to potentially combine some of the technology that we're using on the medical side with some of the educational tools. And that's how this, um, this I founded this company called Q Neuro. So, like any parent, I have this, um, you know, this idea that wouldn't it be great if the same enthusiasm that the kids are showing for their game of the moment, whatever that may be, is, and that they demonstrate for the, the classroom learning. And um, this is nothing new, everybody's talking about it, but it turns out to be a very complex pro problem. There's systems within systems, and each one of these systems has subsystems, and um, they all have to work in perfect balance and harmony to get this engaging, motivating, rewarding game that we're talking about. Um, and looking at it from a neuroscience perspective, it's, it's equally complex. All the different systems that have to be working um, in coherence with each other, talking to each other, um, it's, it's, a, it's quite a complex problem um, and a quite a complex uh, series of events that has to happen. Well, wouldn't it be great if we had an actual um, window into that process as it's occurring? We do, and um, it's, uh, we're using EEG. So it, with this wearable revolution that we know with Fitbits and the fitness industry and all of that stuff, there also has kind of been quietly over the last five years these portable EEG headsets. They just haven't found a, a, a purpose for, for being out there yet. That's why they haven't really taken off. But there, um, we thought if we apply this to learning, we can have a window into the brain, into the organ of learning as it's actually learning. So um, the, I, the idea, we have an extensive body of literature and behavioral research for cognitive load. And by modulating cognitive load, that's basically the mental effort. How hard is the brain working when it's learning something? Um, and EEG happens to be a really, really good measure of that. So we combine these tools together, and we have this, um, you know, uh, on, the, on, the, on the left here, we have this performance mental effort curve. And the idea, the goal is to get to the highest efficiency state of learning. That's the lowest mental effort with the highest performance outcome. And um, that's what our technology uh, is, is attempting to do. So we have these gamified lessons. These gamified lessons are not easy to create. I showed you that, that you know, kind of complex chart. That is, we have an interdisciplinary team. We have neuroscientists, we have educators, we have um, systems engineers, we have programmers, we have artists all collaborating together to work to create these games. Um, games around educational lessons. And these, these games now have embedded in them this framework that we can manipulate and modulate certain items in there based off of the, the EEG um, feedback that we're getting. So we have this real-time brain state monitoring as they're playing the game. We analyze the EEG to determine things like cognitive load, attention, engagement, and then we dynamically adjust parameters in the game so that um, the cognitive load is modulated. The result is improved engagement, retention, memory transfer, and um, we have a series of apps out right now. Um, uh, one is based off of the Common Core State Curriculum, which is the US system um, for across about 44 different states. Um, and they have, um, we have uh, about 40, 45 plus um, unique games corresponding to individual standards, engaging gameplay, and then we have two other games which are more user-generated content. Um, what I'd like to say, so tying this back into the topic at hand, what I believe this is, is this, these squiggly lines that you see up there, that's EEG. This EEG represents electrical activity of the brain, but I see it as this ocean of untapped information. If we're able to actually get more out of this than just the cognitive load, though the cognitive load is an extremely valuable starting point, it's just the tip of the iceberg. 
there's a whole lot of information in there that we have yet to kind of resolve and, and, and tease out. And as we're able to do that, being able to view this window into the brain as it's actually learning gives us a whole new paradigm in, in, in learning. Um, and so to finish off, I'd like to give you just a brief example. We put this into a school in Arkansas. It's still currently um, going through the, the pilot study right now, but we've had some initially great results. And when you see the results, um, like how, how engaged, how happy the, the, oops, the, the kids are, it's quite rewarding. The brains of third graders are being studied while they're in math class. NBC Six's Heather Wright tells us more about research, about what researchers hope to learn. 30 students at Mineral Springs Elementary playing games, learning, and providing data for researchers all at the same time. We are recording their um, brain waves through um, a technology called EEG, which is electroencephalography. The school is partnering with Cube Neuro, a California company that creates educational video games. Experts want to help children learn faster. We can tell from that. Are they engaged? Are they, um, what is their cognitive load? So how hard are they thinking when they're doing this? And there's an optimal zone for that. School officials excited to offer the free opportunity to students. If they start to struggle or things get too difficult, you're gonna see a spike on that brainwave meter and the system itself is going to kind of tone that down. Instructional technology specialist Chad Freeman says the program serves as an extra tool for teachers. Using this technology is designed to give practice. It doesn't replace the instruction. But when I saw the spaceship and everything, I'm like, whoa. Many students say it's already building their confidence in class. So when I started doing it, and I was getting all my questions right and stuff, I thought, maybe I think I'm good at this. We get to learn stuff like rounding, multiplication, and this fun. Educators hope the individualized instruction will create new opportunities for all. We're very hopeful that this is kind of the, the start of something pretty big. Heather Wright, NBC. So, how does this tie into the um, topic at hand? One of the things that is um, potential that we do have in kind of the spatial uh, resolution of the brain and, and some of the brain imaging studies is we can tell um, when somebody has learned something. So, in, in, in looking at math um, and mastery of math topics, the, the actual areas of the brain that are active move from the frontal cortex to the left temporal parietal cortex. And actually, taking that a step further, you see people that have worked with an abacus and using math, different areas of the brain are co-activated when that happens. This is all an amazing bits of information, and then they take genius level people doing the same task, and different areas of the brain are co-active at the same time. So could we potentially use this information? We can't lug a $3 million MRI machine into every classroom and expect that to be a realistic proposition, but these sub 100 US dollar headsets, maybe 15,000 um, rupees here, it's, um, these are, it's potentially, um, uh, it's feasible to put this in the hands of, of everyday consumers. Now, we could have a quantitative measure then of has somebody actually mastered something? So using this technology, using this gaming technology, we could potentially, um, as far as the exam issue goes, um, have even a better, uh, really in-depth knowledge of, of, did they just learn it for the test or did they actually know this at the level of their neural um, circuitry? Um, and just from the textbook standpoint, I would tend to agree that I don't think we're gonna actually get rid of the textbooks. I think we're gonna have some, some symbiosis between the two where you can read the content and then you can click on something and then that'll open up a game that will demonstrate the concept even further. So I don't think we have to say goodbye to any one of the things anytime soon, but I think the real improvement is gonna come in a synergy of all those technologies. Do you have one of those EEG machines with you? Out there. So people are, could, could go out there and put it on.
<laughs> Game are powerful way to engage kids. They help developing problem solving skills. They could um, help kids uh, have uh, better graded schools. I'm sure about that. Uh, but the question is how to create games so that the games will become irresistible so that the teachers will want to replace their textbooks and exams. My name is Caroline Julien, I'm the president of CREO, a production studio based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And uh, we are making games since 16 years. Uh, we are matching knowledge and skills with games. But not just at school, also in public spaces like museum. We love to develop experiences that give the pleasure of learning and spark the curiosity. One source of inspiration is the game Myst, this graphic adventure was that, uh, which was, uh, marked the video industry in 1993. I thought at this time that it would, this kind of game would be a great learning tool if the player would have to use uh, its knowledge scientific knowledge, for example, to solve the game, to solve the enigmas. I heard later that uh, some researchers uh, had uh, that kind of vision, and uh, such as James Paul Guy. Um, for James Paul Guy, present a written text uh, to young people of today is like giving a game instruction booklet without the game. The instruction itself is difficult to read, but once you play the game, then the same book begins easy to, to be easy to read because the content is associated with images and actions, an experience, dialogue, emotions. We are in a world of change and our kids are born with the technology. And some researchers are saying that even their brain is uh, are wired different than ours. And because of that, they don't learn the same way as we are. We like to read something and then experiment what we have read. But the kids of today, lots of them are doing the opposite and then they like to experiment and see what they can learn from this experiment. So I decided to found CREO to explore the potential of educational games. Our first game was a collection of CD-ROM with the license Les Débrouillards, which is uh, very well known in Quebec, um, and Europe also, it's a magazine. The CD-ROMs had success outside of Quebec. They were commercialized in France, in Russia, New Zealand, England. It was a kind of scientific mist um, where the kids had to solve the game with their scientific knowledge. I was impressed how the kids were engaged in the experience and what they seemed to learn. But I would not say that our first game would replace textbook and exam because they were not designed for this. Uh, the game was fun, learners were active agent, uh, not passive, the, and the content uh, was integrated into a storytelling, which is good, but we, didn't, we, didn't, we, didn't, we made a mistake. No teacher were integrated in the conception process. In fact, the teachers came at the end of the process, when the game was finished, and then we asked the teacher, can you uh, produce us uh, an education, uh, uh, educational guide so that the, the, the teachers will like to use the game? This doesn't fit very well. The game was good, but to make sure that a game would fit the teacher's need, we had to co-create it with educator and also a curriculum specialist who uh, will to produce a game that uh, teachers will like it. Then we began uh, to change the way we work. Uh, while we were developing a second project a few years later, so the online game for science platform, which has reached more than uh, one million kids from 200 countries. It's a virtual world you, you explore in the skin of your avatar um, on 
12 Island, you are role playing and experimenting science jobs like chemist, uh, in which you are learning uh, mathematics and science, while you are visually vi visualizing your future. There's uh, 250 games, and by integrating uh, the content uh, in live context and also in industrial uh, context, you, you understand a little bit more why you are learning and how your learning can help you uh, one day in your job, but also uh, you can um, uh, see while you're playing uh, how you can uh, use what you learn uh, to succeed uh, in the game. But does it really work? Uh, do, could we learn with the game? Um, in 1983, oh, um, I don't need the sound. In 1913, a collaboration with the researchers of UCAM, uh, we was uh, developed the game Mechanica, uh, was game designed by one uh, um, Quebecers uh, here, François Boucher Genes, uh, in his master, and the game was uh, broadcast in Game for Science platform. It was uh, um, another pivotal moment for us because it influenced the way we design games. We realized that game is not just engaging and stimulating curiosity as we taught in the beginning, but um, the game um, offers 50 challenges, uh, uh, and what is interesting is that we learn uh, doing that that the, our preconception uh, are very resistant, and the brain so resistant that the textual explanation feels to talk them, and quiz question doesn't do the, the job either, not more efficient. So what is needed is a gameplay built to allow you to experiment and even make mistakes, like we did at, as game designer uh, in the beginning, and, 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 uh, and, and, and make mistakes so to solve counterintuitive game situation, uh, game designed to trap the student, to make him realize by himself that his understanding is wrong, and a game design organized in such a way that it's necessary to rethink your worldview and master the concept to succeed the level. I would not say that all the game uh, we did uh, work because there was not research in all around them, but that make us say that yes, games can work because you know, this game, the young people progress four to five times more playing the game than, than those who learn the same concept by traditional learning. Now, uh, we want to go further and see uh, how we can develop games that permit also to work in collaboration to solve the game uh, and develop communication skills and collaboration. We do that with museum. We want to develop educational programs related to their exhibition. With museum, we also see uh, an opportunity to transform even further the gaming and learning experience in exhibition, developing exhibition which integrated a mix of interactivity, interactivity, integrating physical objects you can manipulate and experiment with your body, and virtual uh, that uh, pro, uh, uh, and virtuality that is on a screen or on the floor that permit to give you the advantage of a game, uh, uh, immediate feedback point, uh, a and storytelling, uh, uh, and uh, an experimentation. Um, there's so much potential. So to that question, should we replace textbook? I would say we should enrich the experience and uh, having, in, with the integration of games, but also enrich the experience outside the boundary of the school that uh, permit to the kids to go uh, in the city, in the museum, and uh, uh, have an enriched learning experience.
um, do we have a vote here? I think some say replace and some say not to replace. It sounds interesting. Um, if we listen, if we put these headsets on, we don't have to have tests. And that's what Duraj is saying. Is that right? We don't have to have tests. We just put this thing on and we know whether you learn or not. I would, uh, I'm hesitant to go that far just yet. <laughs> really? You, really? You won't go that far? Oh, okay. I think there will be a point when maybe that would be a reality. Um, but I think what we would do is combine it with tests. So maybe it's not traditional tests, but it's, it's, it's one additional layer, but it's, it's not an insignificant layer. It's actually quite an uh, important thing. We all know this idea of studying for a test, right? You study for a test, you cram it in, and then you forget it six hours later, yep. right? This, this method would kind of ensure that you actually understand it, and you understand it not only at a level that's, that you can just translate um, onto a piece of paper and answer a question, but you have the knowledge and the connections now at least starting to be made that you can translate this into real world. Like, how does this now apply to this? How does this apply to this? That's, a, that's kind of an interplay between multiple different systems. And you can actually get, you can start to tease out that information. At least on the fMRI, you can start to tease that, tease that information out. We're not there with the EEG yet, but at some point we could, we could potentially so, get there. So, let's see if I can get to understand this. The, the fMRI will allow you to look at transfer, the ability to learn something over here, and then apply it over here. It's co-activation of different areas of the brain. So wow. you would have to then extrapolate transfer from that. You know, these different, these different areas that are active, what areas are those actually, um, what, 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 what areas of the brain is that responsible? What function is that responsible for? And then you can see, um, but what we do see in the genius level processing of, of people that, that are able to perform these things is those are lighting up like fireworks in those people, but they're not lighting up in people that have, maybe I, would, I wouldn't say simply, but they have just attained mastery of that. So they might be able to, to do it really well on a test taking uh, thing, but they might not be able to translate that really well to the, to the, to the outside world. Well, it's going to take a few more years before we're ready to replace tests. Yeah. Okay. A few more years, folks. Still going to have to do your tests. Damn. Okay. Let's look at the, this other issue um, of the textbook issue and what role of games in immersion inside a gaming environment. How does that relate to what you would do if you read a book? Santeri was saying, well, if you want to, if you want to get motivated, the game. What do you guys? What, let, let's talk a little bit more about what's the role of immersion in a game to learn both two things, not just content, but process, procedures. The reason I ask that is the the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards, which is sort of a, a, becoming important in the United States emphasizes, de-emphasizes science facts and emphasizes science procedures. That what learning science is about is learning the process of science, interacting with other people and learning the process. The facts of science come along with learning the process. That seems like a, a perfect example of what a game could do that that would allow the kids to learn the, the, the procedures and then the content comes along with it. So you wouldn't need a book. What yeah, do you can think I think about that? Question just a minute. And, and also, we saw the process of making games. So is making games yep. as beneficial as just playing games or more beneficial? So there's two questions. Well, right. Okay, my start. So uh, first, Answering your question, I think that there are places for both. So if we are trying to study sustainability, and at the same time, sustainability is this massively complex thing. And if we try to create a game in order to learn that, that might take away the attention from the actual topic at hand tomorrow. But I think that it would be definitely very valuable learning experience to very, very throughout the understanding complexities. But at the same time, I think that in order to create such a complex simulation, it would take too much time for most educators and learners to actually perform. 
Uh, when you say that, let's back up. Is it, it takes too much time to create that environment? Yeah. So if you created it once, but lots of people could use it. Absolutely. So now, to answer, answer your question, like um, now going back to my sort of book and, and the game. So yeah. of course, book would be very sort of boiled down, trying to be as simplified as possible to provide the basic logic. And now the genius level person probably could understand that in multiple contexts, there's understanding like how it's interconnected with everything. But somebody who is just understands the basics might not have that just yet. So now game can provide that hyper complex situation where you are now going in, let's say we are discussing CO2 emissions. And okay, you understand CO2 emissions, where they come from and what the causes are. Now you have maybe a city to run, yeah. where all everything else that has to do with city running is there. And now you are looking at how the CO2 levels could be lowered by the by the power of the mayor, for example. Right. You understand it in that particular context. Right. But that sounds again like the immersion in the game, learning deep content and processes at the same time. 100%. I would actually argue that these are probably separate things because when you look, I mean, at what game play and making is, I mean, you, you do this in a context, but then Jinji himself said there is a game and then there is everything, the ecology around the game. And when people study gaming, there is obviously a lot of expertise. You have to do reading of instructions, you have to collaborate. I mean, you have to solve complex problems, all of these things which we value, and in the context to kind of find out different information. But then there's also all this what happens outside when you're not in the game, when you join discussion forums, when you connect with others. Uh, and I think that when you're not in the game, but you're kind of about the game, and I think that's where, I mean, you know, books come in when people want to read about context, when they have to, when you talk about science as a process, when people debate theories, I mean, on what is actually the system behind the games and how to solve certain challenges. That's very much what scientists do when they engage in science inquiry. And I think that's where the places are. You know, a textbook, I mean, it's just something we, it's just, I mean, something which is curated. People came together to decide this is the content that responds to certain standard, but nobody says it has to be in form of a book. I mean, that's just how we have chosen as a society to disseminate it. Uh, and the problem with it, is, especially in, in technical and science areas, is that the content is changing and it's you know, very expensive to replace all those printed textbooks. Absolutely. So, so I think that is for me a reason, it's, it's a text, but nobody says the text has to be printed on paper, it can also exist in different formats, uh, and I think it can then easily integrate what Alan Kay calls the dynamic elements, so that the gameplay can become part of the text, or sometimes it's also the text itself. So, uh, um, if I can have... There's something very interesting we've seen uh, uh, over the time. Uh, as I was saying, the first games we were developing, we, we developed uh, educational material around the game so that the teachers will know how to use it and with exercise, written exercise on the side of, the, of playing the game. And, and when we worked on Mechanica with the researchers, um, we, we did also that kind of educational material, but inside the game, no, there's not a lot of words, uh, not quiz question, and not a little bit of instruction, but not too much, because the researchers wanted to see if just having an intuitive game would work uh, with, their, with their research. Um, but after that, we asked to the teachers when we were doing uh, other games later on, and we said, do you want that we do like Mechanica and having a game with no words and having this textbook on the side so that you can validate if your kids have learned? Then the teachers began to say to us, and it was the first time since a lot of years, because in the beginning, the, te the textbook was something like comfort. 
it will play, but I will know that it will learn after, because there's this uh, textbook on the side. But then the teachers began to say la around last year, le last year, why do not integrate the content of the textbook inside the game? So there is a part of the game that is more a game, but then there are quiz questions that permit to integrate the content in words and see uh, uh, if you, what you have learned intuitively, you can name it with words. Uh, and then one tool. So begin to go in that way. Um, maybe changing the word game to simulation, virtual world might be more palatable because games are this new game. Well, some people don't like it, but it sounds like the virtual world and uh, a simulation, that would, with some words, I mean, there's no question that there are words, and that you could look for a book as opposed to a textbook. It sounds like, yeah, we could replace them. And also one thing that should absolutely keep in mind is that I mean, when I'm referring to games in a classroom, for example, I don't see the games in isolation there. That you, they, that the student goes into a class, there is no teacher. They play a game, computer game for 45 minutes and go, go away. That the teacher is there, yeah. the other one challenging, the other one, you know, pointing out, you know, giving problems, and then reflecting. Absolutely not. Kathy, do you want to say something? No, I was just going to ask you. So it, it, it sounds as though we have consensus from the panel that the book does not necessarily imply textbook in paper format. You alluded um, Sintero to, to, I'm Sintero to um, digital media. So are we saying that digital media could indeed replace the quote textbook? Oh, so yeah. it's consensus. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, we well, win. Uh, yes, yes, in general, but that seems that there is some um, type of learning that uh, it would not it would would not work. Even if the text is on the screen, if I read it, I will think I've learned it. And you'll ask the question tomorrow if I've learned it, and no, because the the conception of very persistent in the brain. So we need more than inform strict information written, even if on, on a book or on the screen, and permit to the kids to experiment and transfer their own knowledge by themselves. We'll, we'll, we'll have one more comment, and then we'll, we'll get comments from you guys, okay? okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I was just going in the, in the uh, just, just from always looking at it through the lens of the, the neuroscience perspective, when you get into this immersive world, so let's say virtual reality, for example, you are actually activating a whole bunch of different um, different areas of the brain because you have to move, you're, you're activating your motor cortex in order to move, look around, and explore, and all of those things. So in that sense, that it, it, it does provide actually a more rich experience than just the two-dimensional, definitely the textbook, even the, the two-dimensional digital media, that's the direction for this experiential technology wave that's kind of coming, yep. that um, even from a neuroscience perspective, from that standpoint of, you know, a synchronous uh, firing of multiple different areas of your brain and simultaneous activation, that I think will lend towards um, improved learning. It's interesting, Pearson, the largest textbook company publisher in the world, sold off their textbook publishing component, they kept the assessment component. <laughs> but what we're hearing from the panel, just playing this out over the next two, three, four, five years, that notion of a textbook, gone. And perhaps, Diraj, perhaps, perhaps, the testing might also go away. Perhaps. So now let's ask for some. Do we have a microphone? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, we all one, one. Okay, I see. I have one. Sir, my name is Tika, and my question is that okay, in the kindergarten level, all the primary level, these games can be useful. But as the levels are increasing in the education, whether a person wants to study in medicine, he need to concentrate in studying for a long period of 15 to 16 hours. So, um, 
having more exposure to the screen which emits the UV rays might might um, damage the eyes. So what is the way in that? Damage so, the eyes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, damage it's a very interesting eyes. question. When we go to Taiwan, we go to Singapore, there the eye thing is the issue for them. Yes, I am absolutely sure. So, um, do we have a comments about the damaging the eyes, maybe from playing the game? Well, I can say from my own experience that I've probably spent maybe 50,000 hours of my life playing video games, and uh, my eyesight is 2.5, so I think it's pretty good. But one person's eyesight cannot be determined, it's about majority of the eyesights. It is a concern, absolutely. One of the saw the young lady in the front, you had your hand up, you've got the next one. Oh, look. oh okay, and then you, and then you. Yes, I don't do this question. I agree with Sandri when you said that the board, the games can replace the discovery part. The study can be done by the books. I somehow resonate with what you said. But my question is like, like a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in New York Times which states that the schools in US, uh, the elite schools, the students in the elite schools, are going away from the screen space and going to physical like wooden games. And the, student, and the schools in the public space are going to the poor children, the poor schools are going towards the digital area. Yes. Like, what do you think on that? Like, is it because this is what the, the tech conference is already about? Like, the tech is focusing on the digital games. When you say games, you always focus on digital games. But in the US, it's contrary to what we're trying to do. Is it because these companies are coming to India? Is it because of the market in India? Or is it really a difference? The, if I could summarize, there was an article in the New York Times about two weeks ago which said that the elite schools and the rich people are taking the technology away from their kids, right? Yeah. And that the poor kids are getting the technology. That the rich people are taking it away because they don't think that's a good idea. First off, that was one article, and it's actually that article has caused a lot of pain for people like me, because people quote that article. Now, um, I don't know what the panel has to say about that, about rich they people they and white <laughs> taking away their uh, technology, but that article is has had some impact. I mean, it's always very easy to say to take away something if you have a lot. Uh, and the, the reality is that even in the United States, uh, I live in Philadelphia, it's one of the poorest cities in the, Uni uh, in the United States, I think number one actually, and 40% of uh, school age children have no access to computers or internet. 40%? 40%. Oh. So, I mean, uh, I, I think they would uh, disagree very strongly with the notion. I think what, I mean, the, maybe, I don't know what the, I read the article too. The point is, I mean, we want to have a balanced curriculum. Uh, you know, hands on minds, on hearts, on if you want, since we talk a lot about emotions and uh, emphatic learning. Uh, so the idea that everything moves on the screen, and I saw when you go next door, you have a maker space where you combine the hand, the tangible, and the digital. And so there's an emphasis to make learning multimodal, and I think games actually introduce multimodality by not just being text-based, but by adding images, animations, interactivity, uh, and storytelling as a way uh, so, so this doesn't go, I mean, by just, it's easy for parents in Silicon Valley where the children have so much uh, to say, we're going to remove the access, it's a choice, it's not something, I mean, they don't have to begin with. And, and in those elite schools, they don't allow the standardized tests. And, and because and they can afford not to, right? That's a, it's really a very powerful article, though. Thank you. Um, you're to, oh, do you have a comment? Sorry. No, I was second question. Kathy, do you have a comment? Oh, you, you had a question? Oh, okay. Thank you to all the enlightened personalities for sensitizing us on the global issue. And one thing I want to ask is that can games replace textbooks and exams? For all of you mainly focused on the textbooks. And regarding the exams, you were mentioning about like exercises, but not the exams. 
can the games replace textbooks and exams? Exams also is the key word, no? Oh, can games replace assessments? Uh huh. Well, that's an interesting question. More formal assessments? Yeah. But they do. I mean, when you play a game, that Jim G's observation was that the assessments are embedded. You don't progress through the games unless you solve certain puzzles. And likewise, when you make a game, your success is very visible in the implementation. It's just a different form of assessment than what you say is a standardized test at the exact end of, I mean, a lesson, which is often very disconnected from what the students do in class. So they have to kind of prepare specially and spend time to pass the text. In games, the assessment is embedded and it's contextualized. It would be interesting to have teachers accept that and that's going to be a, uh, that would be a challenge that's going to be the challenge yeah so one of my general comment uh back in that is that if you want to assess how much someone remembers things of course games are not the way to do that and unfortunately in many countries the big board exams are measuring how well we memorize so of course everybody's grinding towards memorization because that's how we are assessed on but now, if we would be assessing skills, like how well somebody would be able to use this chunk of information, think critically, and apply it, then, I mean, games would be perfect for that. Absolutely. But the school is uh, traditionally turn around memorization, was turn around memorization, but uh, is it what we need to do to prepare the kids uh, of tomorrow, knowing that what we learn actually don't, uh, don't necessarily fit what they, they're going to use later on. So that's why I love and I love this idea of experimentation because it's just uh, develop the way we think and we solve problems. Uh, saying that, um, if we want to memorize, it, we, 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 it, 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 we, there, there's some stuff that we need to memorize also. Writing with real paper at uh, these times, I like to, to buy a uh, notebook with real and uh, real uh, pen, and that, that that's good for memorization. But I, I'm not sure if our learning has to be centered around memorization these days. Be that said, um, yeah, that's finished. Your, your, uh, your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, One more question. There we go. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hi. Then you can have your turn too. <laughs> so, uh, this is out of curiosity. I, I used to love cooking until I learned hotel management. And then I hated it. I never went back to the kitchen even now. It, it, and the, my question comes from with games. So, right now, kids, when somebody said that they spent 50,000 hours in games and 20,000 hours in study, and they like doing it because it's not regulated, nobody's watching over their heads, nobody gives a, I mean, it's, it's not educational. And that's why they enjoy gaming. Now, uh, we've been having these discussions in the last two days, and would putting games in the classroom take away from the fun of games and play and... That's a good question. Putting it in the classroom, would it take away from the, the fun independence? I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the act of just simply putting the game in the classroom takes the fun out of it. I think um, you know, putting it in a structured environment where they don't have the freedom to do it as they want, maybe that, that will place some restrictions on them. But the gaming, as I see it, you know, with my kids and their friends, it's a very social thing. They're playing together and they're talking to their friends in the classroom about these games and about those things. So if you put something that's equivalent to their whatever game of the moment is, Minecraft, Fortnite, whatever it is, and you put that equivalent with educational content inside the classroom, I don't think it's a problem at all. Students also know, I mean, that the games they encounter in classrooms are not the games they have in their leisure time. They actually can smell just within seconds if it's an educational game. So, you know, you're not going to put, I mean, a World of Warcraft or anything. Even though some games like Civilizations have been extremely successful 
in history classrooms and their simulations of historical evidence uh, periods and provide the players with an experiential component of how certain kind of movements in history and geographies kind of came about. So I, I, I agree, you know, it's not voluntary. I mean, you know, people, I mean, spend when they play games out of their own volition, it makes a big difference. In classrooms, it's compulsory. Oh, yeah, yes, your turn. I'll just tell a quick personal story because before I was doing this, I was a teacher and I was using Minecraft in my class. Uh, so I was waiting a group of students coming to my class. I had never taught this these uh, students before. I heard through the door a boy was telling to his mates that I've been playing Minecraft for so long, I'm so tired of it, I don't want to play it anymore. Okay, so they came into the class. The boy realized, or I realized, that boy is actually the most excited kid in the class about being there. Um, and why was that? Was that, well, he realized that we are playing with friends, it's the same Minecraft, or at least very similar that he's playing at home. The teacher is the game master there. You know, even still, LAN parties with friends are the best type of video gaming that exists, and now that's basically happening in schools. <laughs> One last question. I had a semi comment uh, as opposed to a question. Okay. In particularly uh, to Diraj. So, I'm just a little concerned about like putting devices on kids and it's almost like making them patients and treating them like objects and patients. As they are supposedly training, it should be ideally a fun activity. And, and then bringing that into classrooms and probably into the houses, etc. We're already a generation that's putting on devices on ourselves, trying to measure everything we do. If you exercise, you measure. You eat, you measure. You sleep, you measure. I don't know everything we are measuring, on top of that we are pushing that down to children. And then this whole question of collecting data on how they are learning and measuring their brains, etc. Somehow just life seems to be disappearing. And just, I mean, where are we getting? So I understand the innovation that's happening and I admire that. But somehow it's just making me so uncomfortable. Like even when I walk by your boat, on that device on people and just monitor them like are we patients? Uh, I'm sorry it just sounds like but I just want to No, that's a fair comment. It's an absolutely fair comment. Yep, there you go. There you, go. you got a hand. <laughs> I, I just quick comment to that. I mean obviously I would disagree. Um, because I don't you know I do work with patients and I see actually the value that this does in helping to treat very serious diseases like epilepsy and being able to, to use that as a tool in the medical profession. The, um, the thing with the kids is, I have kids of my own. I would never put anything on them that I would even think is remotely restrictive or anything like that. This is a tool that it gives us information. All I look at it is in terms of, you have information about the Fitbit that helps get people more active. That's a, that's a useful thing. Sure, you're monitoring something on it, but you're getting a benefit out of it. It's the same thing with the EEG. This is a, you know, they can take it off. It's not forced on their heads. They put it on themselves voluntarily. You know, we have to, we're working on a more comfortable form factor and a cooler form factor so that they might, you know, the younger kids might get something that actually looks, um, looks cool and they would want to wear. Um, but aside from that, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with you. I, I don't, I don't think, I think the information is actually quite good. And you see, you saw the kids' reactions. They're actually quite excited about it. They think it's cool. So, I mean, that's my take on it. They, it will be sold. That data will be sold, right? You know that's going to happen. It the depends EEG on the data will be collected and sold. Yeah. But, but the, we need to protect the kids. I, I hear that. We have one last, I think, one last question. Yeah. One last question. So, uh, it's more like a comment, not exactly okay. a question. So, uh, I think uh, my takeaway is that uh, we are talking about games and not essentially technology. So not not essentially technology, right? So games can be anything. And secondly, uh, so if games replace exams, let's say, uh, in a way it's gonna be like a standardized form of testing because the objectives are going to remain standard and the processes. So what we need to come up with or what we need to evolve is 
different or you know uh, transformative ways of engagement within games itself, so that we can uh, address more creative ways of solving a, a, a game rather than just looking at the outcome. So I think uh, the onus is on the educators to come up with models of games uh, that would not have specific uh, objectives being met, but rather, like you said, you know the process. Uh, uh, being measured as an uh, uh, as the uh, outcome of it, right? Thank you. Multi-model and multi -model. Well, uh, Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we've used this. this uh, oh, I didn't get an answer to my question. Oh. <laughs> 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 a typical student, right? That's what students do. I, I think uh, I think you have a valid point with uh, with your question. I think you need to. Um, you need to see everything is, is kind of in moderation. So you can't, for, you have to have some alternatives for yeah. people who are having some deteriorating vision and, and problems with their vision. I think it's a serious issue and I think you need to address it. So I think it's an excellent, excellent point. But I think, um, I, like I said, not everybody is going to react that way. Everybody is slightly different and everybody's exposure is going to be slightly what different. So we're. <laughs> not, not quite as dangerous as a cigarette, but I mean, at the same time, like I think, I think there needs to be guidelines, and I think we're in the process of getting those guidelines in place. Yeah. I'd like to thank. Yeah, you. thank you very much, all of the members of the panel. You did an excellent job. Please give them a big round of applause. There was a meeting to discuss guidelines for using of digital content, and there was a committee that worked on it, etc. The guidelines is up for validation. If you go to your guidebook, you can actually go and see them, and if you approve of the guidelines, give it a thumbs up, because it's going to be declared tomorrow at the Visa Declaration. So you are all expected to validate those guidelines because we'll approve of them as a conference. So look at those guidelines today for all the people who had concerns.